If you want to understand why the banks are failing at the moment and why more of them are about to collapse, you have to understand fractional reserve banking. Now, I won't make this an academic or a technical discussion. I'll just explain it in layman's terms. The fractional reserve banking, most easiest explained uh, by the following analogy, which is if I'm living on a road of 10 people and they all come to me and say, here's a thousand pounds or a thousand dollars each and they say to me, can you save this $1,000 or this £1,000 for us? So I now have £10,000 in my possession, okay, from 10 people. What I then do is I set up what's known as a fractional reserve to say only a fraction of that money, of each person's money, will be kept in reserve. Now, the current ratio is about 9 to 1 uh, for most banks. It can go up to about 15 to 1 as far as I know. A reserve ratio of 9 to 1 basically means for every £1,000 or every $1,000 that's kept with me, I'm going to use 900 of those £1,000 or $1,000 somewhere else. So if I have $10,000 stored with me, I'm going to use $9,000 somewhere else. Now you might be thinking that sounds like theft or that sounds inappropriate or that sounds a bit unethical. Well it is. All the banks are broke. Uh, Bank Santander, Deutsche Bank, Royal Bank of Scotland, they're all broke. They're broke because we have a system called fractional reserve banking which means that banks can lend money that they don't actually have. It's a criminal scandal and it's been going on for too long. Fractional reserve banking basically is legalised theft and all the banks all around the world, especially commercial banks, central banks I'm not sure, the central national banks, I don't know if they employ fractional, fractional reserve banking, but all commercial banks and most commercial institutions that hold your money employ a form of fractional reserve banking. The question is, what do they actually do with that money? And they've been doing this for over 100 years, by the way, if not even longer. They pick that money up and they usually pass that to either an investment bank or to some sort of investment vehicle. There's, there's a book that you can read that explains this in a lot more detail called Other People's Money, which I'll leave a link to in the description. But what they basically do is they pass that money to an investment bank or it goes into an investment vehicle and they basically invest that money not on the consumer's behalf, not on behalf of the person that's kept a deposit with them. So it's like me being in the house, taking that money and acting like that money belongs to me and then go and basically investing it somewhere else taking a profit from that investment and keeping that to myself and only giving you your deposit back when you need it. So that's basically what fractional reserve banking is uh, is doing. And it's this is legal in the UK and the rest of the world. It's, it's unethically using my money somewhere else to profit off my money. And then uh, what the banks have been doing over the last hundred years is I mean, if you imagine if nine tenths of all the money that's being deposited with you is available to you, that money runs into not just the millions, but into the billions. If everybody is banking with a commercial bank and 90% of that money can be reused somewhere else, then you can just imagine what kind of figure that comes to. And they basically pick that money up and they go out and buy infrastructure services. So uh, rail services, uh, telecommunications companies, um, energy companies, they basically invest in all of these companies and then take a profit on the yield from those as well. So whatever profit these companies generate, the banks keep that to themselves. They don't pass it on to the to the consumer. Because if they did, at least at that point, there would be some sort of ethics to it. You could at least be like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm okay with you doing that. But they don't even do that. What's been going on uh, recently, uh, over the last 10, 20 years, the fragility of this system, that has basically been coming home to roost. This reserve system, is based on a statistical probability. They're asking themselves the question, how likely is uh, are a group of people uh, going to be to come back and uh, want all of their money? So they're based on a probability, a statistical probability, and they know based on the data that they have and how they see people behave and how they see people respond and how things are going on, they know, okay, uh, people are only going to want around about 10% of their money at any one time, or, if we've got 100 people maybe who have deposited with us, maybe three or four of those will want a large amount of money back or most of their money back. But most people, they'll just store the money and leave it where it is. That's what this is operating on. But as you can imagine, as you can understand, it's a very loose thread, okay? Because it's only a statistical probability. So it only takes something very basic to flip that uh, on its head. What happened in the case of SVB, Silicon Valley Bank? 
was basically they'd made an investment and without going into too much detail because it's a little bit superfluous to this conversation but I can go into a little bit more detail at some other time if need be but basically what they did was they invested that money without the permission of their depositors into an investment vehicle they placed a bet that they thought was going to pay off and it didn't that bet didn't pay off and so they didn't have the money coming back that they thought would be coming back and what happened was the people that were banking with them caught wind. So this it was an accidental leak. Everybody suddenly panicked. Everybody who was who uh, was banking with them got alarmed, and then that created what is known as a bank run, right? So everybody came back and said, "Right, I want my money back." But of course, that money isn't there because it's been invested. It's been put somewhere else, and so that's why they froze all the accounts because they didn't have the money to give back to everybody. When you look in your bank account. If you've got $1,000 or £10,000 in your bank account, that number that is displayed there is really just a, a promise, if you will. It's just a denotation to say, well, this is how much money you're supposed to have in your account. That money doesn't actually exist because it's been gambled away. It's been used somewhere else. It's just a number. It's just a representation of what you're supposed to have. So obviously the money wasn't there. Everybody came in, everybody tried to get the money back. And obviously mathematically, it just doesn't work. You can't give everybody's money back because it doesn't exist. And that's what created the banking crisis with SVB. Unfortunately, all the banks are doing this. Most of what the banks are doing is probably even worse than what SVB is doing because what SVB uh, invested in should have been a pretty safe investment. Now, what the other banks are doing uh, they, are, they are investing in vehicles that are not as safe. Things like crypto, uh, which has been really volatile. Things like startups that look like they're a surefire bet and then end up not really delivering the returns. They don't deliver on the hype. The banks have started to get very complacent. They've started to invest in places where it, the guarantee of return is not as much. The likelihood of return is, is not as high. But there's something else that's also in play. There's a number of factors, there's a number of variables that are in play. But another key factor that's in play that's probably contributing to all of this is actually inflation. As the central banks print more money, what that actually does is it's, it actually weakens each dollar. If you print more pounds, you weaken each pound. So when you go out and buy something, the amount that the, each pound or each dollar can actually purchase actually lessens. The purchasing power actually comes down. Basically inflation. So the reason why everything costs more money today compared to five years ago, the same thing that I was buying five years ago today is now costing anywhere between 10%, 20%, 50% more without actually uh, giving me any more value or any more quality is really because more pounds have been printed or more dollars have been printed. So we have inflation. So when inflation kicks in, you have, for example, startups or companies that are heavily dependent on people being able to spend money with them. When you have the rising cost of living, people don't have the disposable income because wages haven't grown in line with inflation. You know, the income hasn't grown in line with inflation. They don't have the money to go and spend. A lot of companies are dependent on consumer spending. And then when you're recovering from, you know, this global event that we've all been recovering from the last few years people haven't been spending as much people haven't been allowed to spend as much and all of that contributes to businesses not being able to survive and those businesses have been propped up by uh, investment money from not directly the banks but investment arms that have been uh, funded by the banks so obviously it doesn't pay off so that then creates a cascading effect so you then have multiple things that then come together and for whatever reason, the these investment vehicles haven't been working. And this is why we are now seeing, or we're getting a lot of news talking about how banks are collapsing or deposits are being locked or accounts are being withheld, especially people that are in business or organizations that deal with a lot of money like charities and stuff. They've all been asked to verify recently um, can you please verify you are who you say you are? Can you please verify you're doing what you what you say you're doing, that you're trading as what you say you're trading as? And can you please provide some further identification? The bank already has all of that information. The um, financial institutions already have this information about you. They know what you're up to. But the reason I think that they're doing this is because they want to build up a narrative to say, well, things went, rather than saying things went sour, right? Because going back to this analogy of if I'm in the house and people are giving this money to me and I want to go and gamble it away, 
I'm going to basically build a story. And the story that I'm going to build is I'm not going to let them know that I'm, I'm gambling their money away. And I'm going to put limits on how much they can uh, take back. And then, I, and then if I want to prevent them from taking their money back, I'm going to make up excuses. I'm going to say, well, I'm going to have to approve this because you've been up to money laundering or I'm going to have to approve this because you've taken too much money out this month or whatever. I'm basically treating that money like it's my own. This is what the banks have been doing. So they're now building up, I think, an additional narrative to say, well, we got we got hit with hacking or we got hit with fraud or we got hit with people doing money laundering, those kind of things. And basically finding some sort of scapegoat apart from actually we have a flawed system and we have a system in which we perform legalized theft. We basically use your money, make a profit on it, and we don't even share that profit with you because at least that would be nice if they at least did that. And now we need to come up with a story as to tell you as to why we can't give you your money back. That's basically what's going on. And it's not just the banks that are, are doing this. All institutions that are, are holding your money are doing this in some shape or form. So pension funds are doing this. Pension funds have a mathematical model that says, well, we expect this many people to die by this age. We expect this many people to, to want to have their pension back. We expect this much money to be coming in from pension payments every month, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But that's a very delicate uh, model. And again, it's based on statistical probabilities. And what happens is, when things change, when you get even one variable that changes in that, right, you get a global event, you get something that happens. And then because they also are gambling that money away, right, what happens is suddenly you have a pension crisis, which is exactly what we're seeing in the UK right now, which is exactly what we saw in 2008, which was the 401k issue in America, is because that money gets gambled away. And then they can't afford to give that back. It's also why they put so much emphasis on, you know, if you if you ever go to your employer and say, I want to opt out of my out of my uh, pension scheme, you're, you're just looked at as if you just suddenly said, I want to end my life because they need that money. They need that money to be coming in for, for this thing to work. There's certain things have to be in place mathematically for it to work. And everything is always dependent on mindset. It's this, you know, it's actually really fragile. It's dependent on sentiment of the consumer, sentiment of the market. And as soon as that sentiment changes, it's just like the wind. As soon as the wind blows the other way, everything just goes to pot. So there was there was a fund in Canada, a pension fund in Canada, and they've suffered a, I believe it's a $30 million loss because they had gone and invested it somewhere else. That investment didn't pay off. So it's people's actual pension money. It's their, you know, it's their savings. They, got, they went and gambled it off. That gamble didn't pay off. They lost all of that money. And now that pension fund has something like a $30 million hole. They shouldn't have been doing anything with that. They should have just been storing it. Which, this is why it actually makes me more of an advocate, a huge advocate for being in control of your own money. I'd rather have, if, if I'm even going to go down the route of cash, I'd rather have that cash at home. I'm somebody that goes down the route of, you know, I think you should have gold and silver in the house because they can't, they can't gamble your money away. That money is stored with you. They can't do that. Uh, do anything with that. Any money that is electronically stored with any financial institution, chances are it's being gambled away somewhere. And this is not just being done with uh, pension funds. This is being done even with bullion banks. Um, and this is how they're actually keeping the prices, price of like gold and silver actually artificially suppressed. Because they're saying to you, when you buy uh, 10 silver bars with them, they're saying, ah, yes, we've put 10 silver bars into your vault for you. You own 10 silver bars now. It's actually not proven to be the reality of the situation. Um, there are a few scandals that came out which actually showed that what they'd been doing was telling people, yep, we have 10 silver bars uh, in waiting for you. And they'd gone down the same route of statistical probability and these mathematical models of they don't expect everybody to call in their silver at the same time. And so they were then selling that same silver bar to somebody else. And everybody who thinks they've got 10 silver bars in their account with this bullion bank actually probably only has one because the bullion bank is not expecting there to be a bank run on the silver or on the gold. And so they're making a lot of money from you. And because they, they, they're they selling the same bar of silver to everybody, it actually dilutes the price of the silver. It artificially keeps that price down just because it's, you know, it's they're reselling it in so many different places. 
um, it dilutes the price of it. That's why it actually the, the price of silver and gold has actually been artificially quite low. It's a large part of it. It's not the only reason, but it's probably a large part of it. So that's what's going on with all of these financial institutions. Now, the funny thing is that the minute I mention crypto, I immediately get trolled and it, it really brings out a lot of monsters, unfortunately. But the problem with crypto is that crypto is doing this at an even worse scale than uh, the banks are and then and what the bullion banks are doing. The whole collapse, if you've heard about this crypto exchange called FTX, which was a crypto exchange in the US that were that was holding a lot of Bitcoin and a lot of Ethereum and a lot of these other um, coins, they were doing something very similar to the bullion banks, which when you were buying one Bitcoin with them or 10 Bitcoins with them, they were actually just putting a written record in your account say this person owes 10 bitcoin but they didn't actually have the bitcoin to sell you so they were taking your money and not actually giving you anything and then all the inflows that they were getting they were actually then going and funding political campaigns with that where that money wasn't going to come back that money was being used for lobbying and, and banks do that as well you know banks will spend that money on political lobbying and you know they'll hand it to corporates and the corporates will spend that money on things like political lobbying and and you know buying creating media narratives and all this kind of stuff to basically shape how we live our lives and and that money doesn't create a return that money just gets spent and it doesn't come back. And and this is what FTX was doing and that money didn't come back. And then, you know, people started catching wind of it. And then all of a sudden the sentiment changed. Everybody tried withdrawing their Bitcoin. And of course, they weren't able to do it because it didn't exist. So crypto is actually doing this in an even worse way than uh, what the banks are doing. You know, there is a little bit of regulation in place with the banks, but even the Islamic banks do this as well. So don't think the Islamic banks are immune to this. Even the Islamic banks are behaving in this way. And this is not halal at all. It's not halal, it's not ethical in any way. They're basically taking your money and, and going and spending it somewhere else, just legalized theft. And the Islamic banks are doing this. So I don't know what makes them Islamic, really, if they can do something as bad as this. Fractional reserve banking, your money is being gambled away, and all the banks are at this. All the commercial banks, at least, are at this. The big ones, the small ones, the legitimate ones, the HSBCs, the Deutsche Banks, the Credit Suisse, the small banks are at it, the independent banks are at it, the crypto exchanges are at it, the pension funds are at it, even the energy companies are at it. Energy companies, you might have noticed the disparity. You might have thought, okay, well, there seems to be a bit of cognitive dissonance here, where, especially if you're in the UK and you drive up and down the, the country and you see windmills everywhere generating energy for energy companies. Energy companies have actually become incredibly efficient over the last 10, 15, 20 years. So why is it that the energy prices are going up? And why is it that the energy companies are going bust? I'll tell you why. Because these energy companies they've been generating surplus of, of revenue, surplus of inflows, and they've gone and gambled it away. What they have been doing is actually very much akin to taking a seat at the poker table, literally walking into a casino. They use these investment vehicles, which, are, which would just get overly complicated to explain over here. But the investment vehicles that they've been using are literally tantamount to gambling. Right, it's literally walking up to a casino and they do all this fancy paper stuff and they, they you know move cards around and stuff. And some days they win and some days they lose. And what's been going on recently is that they've been losing. And I even suspect that they've been losing deliberately because there's people in the middle who are exacting these trades, who are performing these trades. They get to make a lot of money from from this, you know, managing this casino, managing this poker game, right? They're taking the money for themselves. So they extract a lot of money from that and uh, they just walk off with it. And they've made a lot of money and they've only been able to do that uh, because our money is stored with them and uh, now we're all paying for it because they've suffered a lot of losses. They've either suffered a lot of losses or they've helped somebody make a lot of money, but that's left a huge gap in their funds and that's why the energy prices are now going up. We now have to compensate for that. It's the same thing when it comes to rail companies. It's the same thing when it comes to pension funds. This is why they're all having either a crisis or shortages or an increase in costs, but ultimately the consumer is suffering. We are all suffering because they've been playing with our money. And crypto isn't immune to this at all. I'm afraid it isn't. So basically you can see why banks shouldn't be trusted, why financial institutions shouldn't be trusted. You should be able to see why we need to take control of our money. I would far rather live in a world where we all take responsibility for our own money. I'm a huge advocate for that that we store our wealth in a way that that wealth cannot be eroded by other parties. That today, if I have a bar of gold, it, it buys me a car today and in 10 years time, it should be able to do the same thing. I can't do that with Bitcoin. 
I don't know what it's going to be able to do for me in 10 years. It might be able to do more. It might be able to do less, but it's it's very volatile. I don't want to be in a situation where I have a £10 note or a £20 note in my wallet and suddenly tomorrow the bank says, well, that's not worth anything now because we've demonetized you. I don't want to be in that situation. I don't want to live in that world where somebody else gets to have control over my wealth. I don't really trust leaving this money with institutions that will go and gamble my money away. I'd rather be in possession of it myself. But unfortunately, we live in a world where up till now, banks were probably the most trusted institutions in the world. I mean, if you want to open an account somewhere, one of the things that they almost always ask you is for a bank statement. That's how trusted banks are, but that's just so upside down. Why do we live in a world where the very institution that is doing acts of riba, that is doing this legalized theft, that that is an institution that's considered to be the most trusted? That's how upside down this world is. Anyway, I think that um, with this looming banking crisis and this banking collapse, I think all this is going to change. I think we're all about to get a rude awakening and we're all about to see, hopefully, the deception for what it is. And hopefully we can all learn from that. And uh, hopefully we can all adapt and change the way that we manage our wealth. I'm, I know it's really scary um, that being a banking collapse or being a banking crisis. But I, I, I genuinely in my heart believe that there is a lot of good to come from it. We just can't see that right now. I think it would be a good thing if we all collectively learn to distrust banks and actually learn to trust each other and learn to trust means of wealth that are actually a lot more secure, that are not at the mercy of these big financial institutions. And I'm really hopeful that that is a world that is that we're going to walk into. I don't know if that's going to be straight away, but I'm really hopeful that that is a world that we are walking into quite soon. A world in which we don't have to worry so much about the wealth that we hold. If you have any questions about the content or the subject matter, the things that I've discussed in this video, then please sign up to my Discord. The link is in the description below. It's a small app that you can use, very similar to how chat groups used to work before. You can be anywhere in the world and sign up for it. All you have to do is, is sign up via Patreon, which will then give you access to the Discord app. It is a like-minded community of other people that are talking about the same things, but we can just speak openly to each other. You might have some questions of your own, or you might have some insight of your own. Come and talk to me, come and talk to others. We can share ideas with each other and we, and we can grow as a community.